This week, I explored the life and work of John Rodham Spencer Stanhope, Evelyn de Morgan's maternal uncle. In the talk, we looked at his family, his friends and his time in Florence, as these are three key aspects that shaped his life and career. His family was from nobility and this is his, uh, his great grandfather on his mother's side, Thomas William Coke, the first Earl of Leicester. His mother was Elizabeth Coke and she was trained in art by Gainsborough. So as well as nobility on his mother's side, he also had artistry. She married John Spencer Stanhope of Cannon Hall in Barnsley. And this is where the young John Rodham grew up. He was the second child to the Spencer Stanhopes. His elder brother Walter inherited the estate and this left Rodham free to continue and uh, develop his career as an artist. He did that from an early age, painting here his nephew, John Montague Spencer Stanhope. Evelyn de Morgan shared this passion for uh, creating portraits of her family. Both Rodham and Evelyn rarely painted portraits and when they did, it was only of those they knew particularly well. This beautiful and arresting portrait by Evelyn de Morgan, painted between 1883 and 1884, of her cousins, Alice and Winifred Spencer Stanhope, who were two of Walter's children. He had 15 in total. Another intimate family portrait by Evelyn de Morgan was that of her uncle, John Rodham Spencer Stanhope, who took her under his wing as a young artist, invited her to stay with him in Italy, and really helped to pave the way for her to follow her own career as an artist. Their artwork is incredibly similar, and that is exemplified um, by Flora, uh, a subject that both of them tackled with beautiful results. But everything from the composition to the elongated neck is taken from Renaissance painting and is shared by the two artists, as is their minute attention to detail in the floral arrangement uh, across the flower beds that the goddess Flora stands on in each painting. Again, uh, an example of how their artwork is very similar is in uh, the subject matter they deal with. And here the subject is grief. Um, in the Spencer Stanhope, on the left hand side, you can see a young girl clutching a bird that's passed away. And on the right hand side, we have a woman left in mourning um, with the seascape on the horizon and uh, a, a sunrise bursting, hopefully, uh, across um, behind her, across the, the horizon there, representing the fact that Evelyn de Morgan, as a spiritualist, believed that death was actually this portal and to the next life. A painting which I think is uh, incredibly similar and shows that the artistic direction maybe wasn't just uh, from uncle to niece, but was reciprocal, um, is Evelyn de Morgan's painting, The Waters of Babylon on the top, which predates Spencer Stanhope's The Waters of Lethe on the bottom, which is in the collection of Manchester Art Gallery. In the top painting, de Morgan has taken her subject from the Bible and we have here the Jews that have been exiled from their homeland. You see their anguish and despair as they sit on the banks of the river, unable to play their musical instruments because of the sadness that they feel. At the bottom, we have Spencer Stanhope's The Waters of Lethe. You see people at the end of their life, again, full of anguish, and the bodies that have been uh, moved around into these uh, sort of desperate, uh, painful looking shapes to represent the emotional pain and suffering that happens at the end of life. As the bodies drop into the water, they are renewed and a rebirth happens. And you see them in this Garden of Eden type landscape at the back of the painting. The composition in both with these two planes uh, really do uh, resonate quite strongly. The two artists really collaborated uh, properly, as it were, in 1883, when the Spencer Stanhope family paid for the local church to Cannon Hall in Cawthorn to be redecorated. Spencer Stanhope uh, engaged his good friend G.F. Bodley as the arts and crafts architect to take on the project, and as well as Spencer Stanhope's panels for the pulpit, which you see on the left, Evelyn de Morgan created panels in gesso with gold leaf on the right hand side to decorate the church's interior. Another local church that benefited was Hoyland Swain, and here you see the Spencer Stanhope mural across the top of the church there. John Rodham Spencer Stanhope lived at Hill House, in the 1850s. In 1856 he married his wife Lilla Elizabeth King um, and they uh, she already had a daughter so he inherited a stepdaughter Marjorie and they had a daughter Mary together and they lived at Hill House which overlooked the valley and Cannon Hall on the opposite hillside. 
One of the ceilings at um, Hill House has been decorated with these puncture marks and that really closely resembles the ceiling that was found at um, the Webb home Red House that he had created for William Morris. And there we see the exterior of the Red House, it's beautiful medieval uh, French inspired exterior. When Spencer Stanhope wanted to move closer to London, to Surrey, to be near his tutor G.F. Watts um, and also to be closer to the London art scene, he engaged Philip Webb to create Sandroid for him and that was completed in 1861. It was only the second house that Philip Webb had been engaged to design and that really just shows uh, the close friendship between Morris, Spencer Stanhope and Webb and that whole network of pre-Raphaelite and arts and crafts artists. Burn Jones was engaged by Spencer Stanhope to uh, create some um, ceramic tiles for the interior of Sandroid. And there we see um, the, the images here taken from Chaucer's Legend of the Good Women and Burn Jones on the right hand side. G.F. Watts was sought out by a young Spencer Stanhope whilst he was a student at Oxford University as he decided to become an artist and wanted the best as his tutor. Watts only ever took on one of the pupils, so was obviously inspired and intrigued by this young artist who had determinedly uh, asked him to be his tutor. The two traveled through Italy together um, throughout the 18, uh, late 1850s and um, created beautiful watercolor landscapes of what they saw there. In 1856, Spencer Stanhope was one of the pre-Raphaelites engaged by Rossetti to decorate the ceiling of the Oxford Union Debating Chamber, which is now a library. This is where he first met Morris and Byrne Jones and was introduced to this sort of second wave of pre-Raphaelites. By 1856, of course, the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, which had been established by Rossetti and others in London in 1848, had all but disbanded. So that's why it's known as the second wave of pre-Raphaelites. Spencer Stanhope uh, did have a studio in London and that was actually above Rossetti's house. Um, and in this painting, we have uh, the subject matter that's been tackled of um, a fallen woman in the Victorian period. There she is with her head against the wall as a young chap who's come up from the country who remembers her from her childhood and her country days, comes uh, to collect her and, and, and sort of get back and try to engage with her as she's obviously fallen to a life of prostitution. And the calf in the background suggests this innocence and um, this uh, that has been taken away from her. Spencer Stanhope's studio was above uh, Rossetti's and from that studio he painted Thoughts of the Past 1859, one of his few paintings that does um, engage with this uh, ideas of comment on social issues and the same as the Rossetti painting from around the same time we have um, a, a a prostitute who's realised the error of her ways and is looking longingly out of the canvas towards her past to try and um, uh, and better herself again. Uh, she sort of realised the error of her ways. And the model is Fanny Cornforth, who is the same model in Rossetti's picture found. Again, pegging Spencer Stanhope in this circle of artists working at this time. What's she looking back to? One of Spencer Stanhope's uh, other pictures um, uh, that's pendant to it, which is uh, quite uh, a, a difficult picture in that it portrays a very young girl who has quite clearly just lost her virginity, hinted at by the fact that the floral crown has been taken off her head and she's lying with these flushed, flushed cheeks in the countryside. And again, this shows that uh, our, our prostitute from Thoughts of the Past actually probably had a particularly difficult childhood. Spencer Sanop soon developed uh, his more aesthetic style. He was an artist that exhibited at the Revolutionary Grosvenor Gallery, as opposed to the Royal Academy, for artists that were painting in this style. The aesthetic movement, of course, uh, was, had the motto, art for art's sake, meaning that artists wanted to create beautiful paintings without social commentary. And that's when Spencer Stanhope moved away from what he'd been doing already. The pose of the maiden in Love and the Maiden that we've just seen is very similar to Evelyn de Morgan's Ariadne at Naxos, which went into the same Grosvenor Gallery exhibition of 1877, again showing that close relationship between uncle and niece. Florence was a key aspect of Spencer Stanhope's life and work, and he moved there full time in 1873. 
Prior to that, his young daughter Mary had passed away very tragically at the age of seven years old and he designed a headstone for her. And I think it's interesting the family chose to inter her body in Florence, even though they didn't live there full time, um, because it shows that want uh, and that love of the country and uh, the fact that they would eventually move there. The De Morgan collection has wonderful photographs of the interior of the Villa Nuti, which Spencer Stanhope took a lease on full time in 1873. And many artists, including Burne Jones, visited Villa Nuti in Florence. Evelyn de Morgan loved spending time there. And this is her painting, The Bells of San Vito, in which we can see the tower of Bellascardo, the village Villa Nuti sat in just outside of Florence in her painting in the collection of the National Trust at Whittick Manor. Through his connections, Spencer Stanhope continued to make artwork and murals for buildings back at home in the UK. And his friend G.F. Bodley, who we worked with on Cawthorne Church, engaged him to create the murals for Marlborough College's new chapel, which we can see here. His work on ecclesiastical pieces continued and he was uh, engaged to um, create reredos for four churches in Florence. And here we have a design um, in watercolour rather than this being the complete altarpiece. This is a maquette for it. Um, and this is for the Holy Trinity Church in Florence and it's uh, the life of Christ surrounded by angels. Spencer Stanhope's uh, beauty and uh, his, his aesthetic work continued throughout his life. And we look at some of his later paintings here, Patience on a Monument, Smiling at Grief. If you remember his previous painting um, of, about, about grief, this is similar. And then we have Patience looking at grief and the idea is that grief will pass. Of course, losing his own daughter so young, this would have been a subject close to his heart. There's a beautiful sketch for this painting in the De Morgan Foundation's archive as well. The Bones of Ezekiel is uh, quite a difficult later painting by Spencer Stanhope, again focuses on a biblical theme taken from the Old Testament in which Ezekiel, or the prophet, walks through a valley of dry bones and, and this resurrects them. So it's a painting that uh, sort of uh, confronts the ideas of the, of the Last Judgment. After a whole career of exhibiting in avant-garde art galleries, Spencer Stanhope actually exhibited this picture at the Royal Academy just before his death in 1907. Um, and it's quite a quaint picture that depicts a rural English countryside. So it leans on those aesthetic ideals, but it's, uh, it was quite a strange move for him to be exhibiting at the Royal Academy after such um, an avant-garde career. In the collection of the De Morgan Foundation, we have this brilliant picture, the women of Sorrento, and I think it captures everything really about Spencer Stanhope's life and work. It's a beautiful aesthetic picture in which we're focusing on the ordinary people in Italy and that beautiful Italian landscape, which Spencer Stanhope also loved, rather than focusing on any action that might be going on in the picture. Of course, the full title is the women of Sorrento drawing in the boats, but we don't get to see any boats. That element of activity is taken taken away and we focus instead on the beautiful drapery and um, uh, arrangement of the picture. So a true aesthetic picture. And this painting can be found in our exhibition, A Family of Artists at Cannon Hall in Barnsley, which really gets to the heart of Spencer Stanhope's uh, nurturing of his young nieces and his help of them to become artists. Of course, Evelyn de Morgan was one of them. And it looks at the bronze sculpture work of Gertrude Spencer Stanhope as well. So I hope you've enjoyed this short summary of our talks. These will be making it onto our YouTube channel um, throughout lockdown. And uh, it's, a, it's a lovely way to be able to share, um, share some ideas and uh, uh, parts of our, our collection with you um, whilst our museums are still closed. We hope to start reopening soon and you must check our website at www.demorgan.org.uk to learn how and when you will be able to visit us again. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Please do check out what's on pages of our website as well to find out when the next talks are and how to buy tickets. And if you'd like to make a donation for watching this talk, then you can do that either by clicking the link that accompanies the video or by doing so on our website as well. Thank you so much.